Thanks. So um, today we're starting a new series. So this new series is titled The Windows of Heaven. And we've got a few messages prepared. Um, next time we're in the building, we've actually got a guest speaker coming, um, Steve Jaffiers from up in Hamilton. Um, he was due to come last year, and lockdown happened. And we ended up having, a, it was a great message actually, um, on the middle, um, but it was done by video. So uh, not two weeks, but three weeks' time, we'll have Steve in the building and be great for him to share um, a message. And then we've got some coming on video, so yeah, so we're starting this messages, messages on the windows of heaven, and the windows of heaven is mentioned a few times in the Bible, I think six, um, but the one that we're taking it from is from Malachi chapter 3, verse 10, which says this, and I read it earlier, bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Now try me in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing, there will not be room to receive it. So I'm just going to go through that um, line by line for a start, and then we're going to look a little bit at the windows of heaven, and then we're going to look at the overflowing blessing for today. So the first um, line is bring all the tithes into the storehouse. So what are the tithes? So in the law, um, in the, um, they, they required that the first 10% they were to bring to the temple of God. Okay, and um, now in the church, there's a bit of controversy about, you know, well, that's the law, and Jesus set us free from the law, and other people say, well, no, it's tithing still valid, and I just want to say today, it doesn't actually matter what your stance is on that, generosity towards God, generosity towards other, sacrificial generosity is commanded throughout the Bible, New Testament, Old Testament. Um, I believe in tithing, um, but as I say, it doesn't matter what your stance is. Generosity, sacrificial generosity is required regardless on where you sit on that. Okay, and then he says, why? That there may be food in my house. And I, that's from our Passover, actually, that photo, where there was food in this house. Um, and in the old days, they had the temple, and they had priests ministering before God in the temple. And things are a little bit different now in that we're all ministers towards God. So this morning we worship, we all ministered towards God. But it's all the same, the church has staff, and, and, and well, I think our staff deserve to eat. I quite like Phil. I think he should be able to eat. So we still need food in the house for that, but Actually, there's a lot more to that there may be food in the house, and I'm going to circle back to that later. I'm going to look at something that Jesus said and circle back towards that, towards the end of this message. Now, try me on this, says the Lord of hosts. Um, that's a cat at the hot pools, and he was trying something on of my hot chips, and um, he didn't get very far. Um, and we went there, back there yesterday, actually, and he tried to stow away on our boat, but I kicked him out. Uh, but this is the only place in the Bible where God says to test him on something or to try him on something, because everywhere else it says, no, don't try the God, Lord to God. But uh, as far as generosity goes and him being generous back to us, he says, well, test me on this. I'm more than able to meet that. If I will not open the windows of heaven. I'm going to come back to that, so we'll do that. And then the last, and pour out such a blessing, there will not be room enough to receive it. Um, just like that cup, there's not enough room for what's being poured in there today. So I've titled this message today, overflowing blessing, because um, at that last line, that God is going to pour out such a blessing, there will not be room to receive it. So I'm going to look a little bit at uh, the windows of heaven, and then what does overflowing blessing look like? But first, um, so we've titled the series Windows of Heaven. Who here has got the NIV or looking at the NIV in front of them? Yep, oh, and, and can you tell me where it says windows of heaven in the um, um, NIV? What does it say in that? 
Anyone got it handy? The floodgates. Yes, you've probably figured out why I needed a photo of the floodgates in my um, testimony earlier. Yes, it says floodgates in the NIV. Um, so why does it say floodgates? And, and what's the difference? You know, Because most translations actually say windows, um, but the NIV says floodgates. So I'm going to look into why there's a couple of different translations and then tell you what the one that I think is correct. Okay, because there's quite a difference between a window, and you might recognize that as a Phil's window out there. Um, I think that was taken on Wednesday. You can see the reflection of the car. You can even vaguely see uh, my reflection taking the photo in that window. But windows, they sort of serve as an interface from the inside to the outside, and you can open them and, and pass things through them. And that's quite different to a floodgate. So this is Fokamaru Dam on Tuesday when they weren't releasing, and a floodgate is on a lake, and it's, it basically is holding the water back, and then when there gets to be too much water, they can open up, as you can see here. And um, it looks good that way, but then when I turn around the other way, just, man, the, the power of that water is just amazing. And I went down to the bottom. I didn't get a good view, but it was just, well, I would not want to be in there. <laughs> okay, so, yeah, so now the, the word window or floodgate comes from, uh, I think it's six times, or the floodgates of heaven is mentioned six times in the Bible, um, and it's the uh, word window is arabu for those who like the Hebrew. Um, and the reason that the NIV have translated it um, as floodgate comes from the first time it's meant to me mentioned in the Bible. Oh, look at that. That's looking through a window at a floodgate. That's on Waipapa Dan. Um, so, yeah. And um, so the first time it's mentioned in the Bible, this term, windows of heaven, is in Genesis 1, verse 11. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on that day, the fountains of the deep, of the great deep, were broken up, and the windows of heaven were open. And the NIV says the floodgates of heaven. And this is why it's been translated as floodgate, because of the flood. That was, um, that's what happened. You know, the, the floodgates were open, or the windows were open, and there was a massive um, um, flood. And so here, we can actually see what happens when God opens up the windows of heaven. Now, this time, they were open up in judgment, Okay. And, and Malachi, they're talking about being opened up in blessing. But we can see when the windows of heaven were opened up in judgment, um, we get 40 days and 40 nights of rain. It engulfed the whole earth. It changed the topography of the earth, and it even changed the hydrology of the earth. Um, and so much so that anyone that lived in the days before the flood would scarcely recognize the world we live in now. It's so different to what it was before the flood. Now, I'm a, I'm a, I'm, I'm big believer that the account of Genesis is the correct one, that we live in a young earth, okay? And I know there's debate about that as well. Now, the, it talks in Genesis, early Genesis, about the waters above too, which um, some, including me, believe is actually a, a layer of solid ice, um, and which would literally be a window to heaven, okay? So, and that was opened up and judgment came. And the, um, so windows of heaven is a better translation. And the other reason windows is a better translation to floodgates is that in, the, in biblical times, they did some quite amazing hydrology architecture. So I've been to Nimes, so, which is from the same sort of time frame, but different place. And there you've got an aqueduct built in the Roman times to transport water to the city of Nimes. And in the Bible, you've got Hezekiah, um, Hezekiah's tunnel, um, which um, the, the water source in Jerusalem, quite an amazing structure, which meant that in a time of siege, they had security of water to the city. So there was some uh, amazing hydrology going on at the time, but not to the scale of damming whole rivers. So they actually didn't need floodgates in biblical times. So therefore, windows of heaven as we've titled the series, 
is a better translation than floodgates. Sorry, NIV. But um, yeah, so, right, so that's it. So now, and we saw with the flood that, that when the windows of heaven were open, you know, a big deal, you know, what happened when it was open in judgment. Can you imagine those same windows of heaven being open in blessing? What would that mean? Wow, you know, I'm going to pour, Malachi 3.10 says this, I will pour out such a blessing for you that there will not be room to receive it. Wow. Oh, handle that. So, so that begs the question, okay? So if I tithe, if I do what it says, does that mean that I'm going to be rich? That's a, that's a good question. What do you think? Does it mean I'm going to be rich? Or exactly, Kathy. What does riches mean? What are true riches? And we find that in Matthew. I'm going to look at the words of Jesus now. Matthew 6, 19 says this, Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourself treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Hmm. So, yeah, so Jesus is saying, actually, what is counted as riches in this world aren't necessarily riches in the kingdom of God. In fact, true riches probably we find more in Galatians 5.22, which is known as the fruit of the Spirit. It says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. Maybe that's some of the riches that God wants to pour out on us. He wants us to have overwhelming joy, joy that we can't contain. What about that? Love that we can't contain, peace that we can't contain. Now, that doesn't mean that he won't bless us in material ways as well. But here, what he, this is what he's saying, true riches are. What else does he say in his uh, word? A good name. A good name is more desirable than great riches. To be esteemed is better than silver or gold. Mm. So the blessing that God promises to pour out on us, the, the overflowing blessing, now it may be material things, um, but you know what he chooses to bless us with is actually not up to me. Okay, he says that if I'm faithful to do this, he will put an overflowing blessing into my life. But what that blessing looked like? Well, I know what I would like, but he knows me even better, and he knows what I need. And the overflowing blessing that he's going to give to me or to you as you are obedient to him is actually up to him and not us. Saying that, there is a promise of provision, of material provision. So if you're obedient to him, you may not have everything you want, but you will have everything you need. So Jesus, again, a little bit further in um, Matthew 6, 31. So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So here he's saying, put me as a priority. Put the things of God as a priority. Honor God with your finances. Honor God with your time. Honor God with the things that you do. And God knows what you need. He will provide all that you need. So yeah, that's a, that's a promise of provision. So if you are obedient to God in your finances, you will always have enough. He will provide for you. Test me in this, he says in Malachi. So he will provide what you need. Another place in the New Testament, Philippians 4.19 
Uh, Paul writes this to the church of Philippi, and my God will meet all your needs according to the richness of his glory in Christ Jesus. And if we read Philippians 4, we see that the people of the church of Philippi had given a generous gift to Paul. Paul was in need, he was in prison, and so the people of Philippi had raised money and they'd um, provided for him, for the ministry and the work that he was doing. And then Paul says, well, God has seen the generous gift you've given to me, and he will provide, the, um, he will provide for you as well, because he knows what you, you need. So, yeah, so God has a promise of overflowing blessing, overflowing provision um, if we... Um, uh, generous to him if we tithe. So I want to tell you a little bit about my own story and journey on tithing. So I grew up, and we didn't have a lot of money when I grew up. That was the family vehicle. Um, so this would have probably been in the 80s, mid-80s. We were driving that, and that was probably a 30-year-old van there. It's probably worth a whole lot of money now, but it wasn't then. Okay, so I grew up in a household where we didn't have a whole lot of money. The doors would fall off. We'd be driving down the highway, and, and like if you turn the corner right, because they're sliding doors, it just fall off. It was, it was um, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, luckily the small, the windows were small, so no one could see you in it. But yeah. Um, anyway, so so. Anyway, but because I grew up in a house where money was, wasn't abundant, I kind of, money started to be, like, have a place in my heart, like, oh, you get money and you have to hold on to it, okay? So I was, I was quite stingy, I was quite tight, um, I still am in a little bit, old habits dried a bit hard, but, 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 you know, money had this place in my life, you know, it's, if you get it, you've got to keep it. Okay, and then I became a Christian, final year of university. First year of a Christian, I was a student, so I didn't have any. So then, but then I started working as a veterinarian, and I thought, you know, I'm going to do this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tithe. So I did. 10% um, I gave to God, gave back to the church, and had been doing it ever since. And I just found that it just lowered the place that money had in my heart by tithing, you know, it used to be up here, you know, it's good, you've got to hold on to it, you've got to have it, and then as I released those finances back to God, um, then I found it just didn't have that same place in my heart that it did before, and that is, you know, just God working in me, and, you know, and so I've been tithing, 10% of gross, you know, some people say, oh, New Testament, now listen to the Holy Spirit, so I asked the Holy Spirit, what should I do, he said 10%, so easy, I like the mass, it's really easy to work it out, um, so, so that's what I do, okay, and um, as I did that, you know, God has blessed me. I have never been without. I've never been with lack, with lack. He's always provided everything he needs. Has my bank account been overflowing that I can't contain it? No, I've got wife and two teenagers' daughters. That answer should be quite clear. No, <laughs> no, the you know, it's not where I would like it to be, but it's saying that I've never been in lack and we've never been lacking for anything. Has God blessed me in other ways abundantly and poured out his blessing in other ways? Absolutely he has. Um, little testimony, about a year ago, we'd been working quite hard at work and, and someone at work decided we're going to bless everyone at work by getting a masseuse in and give them a 10-minute back massage each. And I th so that was all right. So I got my turn for the back now. So I sat there and I was like, oh, it's quite nice. And the, and the lady doing it said, huh, you're really relaxed. I said, am I? She said, yeah, yeah, everyone else, they're all tense and all that, but your muscles, they're just really relaxed. Oh, I said, really? Well, it's just normal. And what got me wondering, why is everyone else so tense? And you know what I think it is? I think that's God flowing out, overflowing, abundant peace in my life. And because of that, that's just normal for me. But it clearly isn't normal for everyone else. And that's overflowing, abundant peace that has, God has put into my life. And look, he you know, blesses us as he chooses fit to bless us, not necessarily how we think it should be. 
Okay, but as I say, um, God has promised that there will be provision. He has promised that there will always be enough to sustain us, which brings me back to Jesus, what sustained Jesus. Okay, and I want to read from John 4, 31 to 34. In the meantime, his disciples urged him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat, which you do not know. Therefore the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought anything, him anything to eat? Jesus said this to them, My food is to do the will of the one who sent me and to finish his work. So here Jesus is saying what sustains him, what his food is, is to do the will of God. So how does that relate to Malachi 10? Malachi 3.10, you say. Well, Malachi 3.10 says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. So Jesus' food was to do the work that he was sent to do. What is the church's food? It's the same. It's the same. The church's food is to do what God has called us to do. How are we going to do that? Well, there needs to be food in this house in order to do the calling. We're going to need provision. We're going to need resources in order to reach the people that God has called us to reach. So therefore, we are needing the generosity of the people of God in order to fulfill the calling that God has for us, which is to reach this community and the surrounding communities um, and overseas with the love of Jesus Christ. So yeah, so bring the tithes in the full heart, that there may be food in the house. And I'll read the whole thing. Bring all the tithes on the horse house, that there may be food in my house. Now try me in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour out such a blessing, there will not be room to receive it. So Malachi 3.10 contains a blessing, a promise of blessing, that if you're obedient to him, he will open the windows of heaven and flood us with such a blessing that we may not be able to contain it. So who wants to be part of that? You know, because, uh, you know, to do that, we need to be obedient with our finances. We need to honor God in all things, you know, our time, our finances. So, yeah, be generous towards God, and he will be generous towards us. And just as I was thinking how to end this, I felt that um, God wanted to overflow his joy on the people today. So I'm just going to pray a blessing over you now that you will be overflowing. There's just a taster of what he's promising here, that you would all be over, um, have overflowing joy in your life. So Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you that we've been able to share together um, and learn from you, Lord. And I just pray for everyone here, everyone watching at home, that right now you would flood them with your joy, Lord, that they would know overflowing joy, overflowing peace in their life, Lord. We thank you for your goodness to us in Jesus' mighty name. Just, church, just soak up the, the joy and the presence of Lord, of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.